Right, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Well, Pete's here. Good morning. Oh, a couple more people. That was still pretty bad. Let's see if third time's a charm. Good morning. There we go. You were at least annoyed enough with me to do it that time. All right. No, I'm blessed to be here this morning. Glad to see you here this morning and looking forward to a good day in the house of the Lord. Looking forward to good fellowship and food afterwards. So don't run off after the service today. We'll have the meal afterwards and time of fellowship together. So I hope you'll join us for that. But right now, join us in singing page number 118, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Let's stand together and lift our voices as a group. Page 118.
Thank you so much. Please be seated. We'll have a song from our choir. When we come back, we'll have a fellowship song. It'll be number 561, 561. together as a church family number 561 561 when you find your place please stand i love to tell the story number 561 we'll take a break after number three for some fellowship 561 i love to tell the story
number four. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. You seem hungry and thirsting to hear it like a rest. And when it sings of glory, I sing a new, new song. Twill be Please come forward. All right. Uh, as the ushers make their way forward, just a reminder, if you're a first-time visitor with us today or you haven't been here in a long time, there's some visitor cards in the pew. If you take a moment and put some in for contact information on there, you don't have to put anything on there that you don't like, but just a, a, an email address or a phone number would be nice just so we have a record of your visit today. If you have time to get that in before the offering, you can do that as a plate passes, or you can put it in the plates in the back at the end of the service if you do that for us. Um, after the morning service this morning, we have a luncheon down in the gym. Everyone here is welcome. There's plenty of food down there, so if you forgot to whip anything up on their way in here this morning, you're more than welcome to still come. Don't feel like you have to have something to come down and fellowship. And I, you know, I would challenge you to make time to do these things so you can get interaction with folks outside of just the service. And so right after the morning service this morning, that'll be right down here in the gymnasium. And uh, lots of food down there and, and uh, fellowship, obviously. A shower of love for Brandon and Gina Powell is still going on out there in the foyer, you can see. And I'll uh, be praying for uh, Miss Gina as she gets closer to delivery and baby Charlotte. And uh, that'll be this Sunday and next Sunday, um, so keep that in mind. And then there's a young adult activity being planned for April the 27th. Uh, please keep that in mind. Also, did I mention the meetings after the service this morning? Now I lost my place because I scrambled this down. But... The meetings afterwards, there's a meeting for the nursery, so we'll have them meet on the piano side. So if you're interested in even considering being part of the nursery, working in, in a service um, and taking care of the kids, please come down. Even if you, it's not a commitment, it's just information. And then also then we'll have a mowing meeting on this side for anyone that's interested in mowing grass, weed whacking, and help keeping up the grounds throughout the summer. Um, as all this rain, this flooding comes, uh, the grass is going to grow. And it's supposed to hit 70 today, I think, so it's probably going to grow four inches. Uh, so we need to be getting on that. And then also just a reminder for prayer time on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. If you'd like to get here in time to be a participant in that. And, uh, of course, choir practice this afternoon. Am I missing anything else? All right, Neil. Sorry, I guess you're the only one. Lord, we, <clears throat> we thank you for this day that you've given us, Father. And just thank you for bringing us all here safely this morning, Father. And pray that you'd be with them, Lord, as they... Uh, prepare the food for us, Lord, and just be with Pastor as he brings forth your word this morning, and bless this offering, Lord, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter number 2. We are, most of our services together, we're studying through the book of 1 Samuel. And uh, there's some amazing <clears throat> things that we're heading towards. And we've seen some, I hope you've seen some blessings so far already. But uh, I'll just be honest with you, this morning there's not a whole lot of joy to be had in, in what we're going to be looking at. And so, Lord willing, there will be some help. Um, the Word of God is always profitable. Um, <clears throat> But sometimes it does a really good job of pointing out what is not right and what is wrong. And there's not a whole lot of joy to be had in that other than, praise God, at least he lets us know. I'm thankful that the Lord tells us exactly what to do, what not to do, teaches us the way to go, uh, so we don't just have to guess. Uh, we can go to the Word of God for every answer. And so we're going to do that this morning. And I am going to be really preaching up myself today as we look at Eli and concerning parenting. And so hopefully it'll be a help to you this morning. It's where we're at in the Word of God. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, we'll read a few verses and then we will pray. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 27. The Bible says, And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation? And honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I is said indeed that thy house and thy house forever, uh, uh, thy house and thy fa house of thy father, sorry, should walk before me forever. But thou, uh, but now the Lord saith, be it far from me for them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the day is come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house, and thou shalt see, uh, thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall be, uh, not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thy house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of, in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's office that I may eat a piece of bread. Let's pray, Lord, we thank you for this day and for your word. Help us now as we study it together. Help us to be edified by it, Lord. Help us to be built up in your word, Lord. Help us to grow in our faith. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have in this passage, uh, in these verses, a warning from the man of God to Eli, the priest of God. Uh, we've already seen how the Eli's sons were, were wicked before God. They, the Bible says they knew not God. Priests that don't know God, that's a sad thing. And they, they were stealing from the offerings and from the sacrifices that which was not their portion to have as their meat. They were stealing to make themselves fat, the Bible says. And they were lying with the women at the temple. They were, they were doing all kinds of, of wickedness. And Eli restrained them not. And so in verses 27 and 28, God begins dealing with Eli by reminding him of his privileged position. Eli is, is the priest. He's part of the priestly line, and God has chosen that line, or had chosen that line to be his priest forever, and, and it's a blessing, and that's a, a privilege to be that, and he reminds him of that, and he declares the offense in verse 29, and the indication is that either Eli was a part of the stealing of the offerings, or that God held him accountable for it. Either way, we see here that the father is expected by God to step in and restrain the children regardless of their age. 
We could say also that the priest is to step in and correct ungodly practices. You cannot be everyone's buddy and be a good father or a good Christian leader. Uh, you cannot be so concerned with how people feel. You've got to be concerned with what's right according to God's word. And so then we see verses 30 to 36, the, the punishment declared. And sadly, there is no verse 37. And I say sadly because what we would hope to see in verse 37 is, is a prayer of forgiveness or of asking for forgiveness, a prayer of repentance, a, a prayer for his family. Lord, please don't let this come to pass. But we don't see anything like that. Now skip ahead with me a little ways. We'll talk about the call of, e, of, of Samuel and next time we're together, Lord willing. But uh, look at with me at 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In, the, in that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to shew Eli the vision. Wouldn't that be a particularly peculiar position to be put in? You're a child, been given to God by your mother, been, been, been ministering at the house of God, at the temple of God, under the, the authority of the priest, and now God has come to you and told you that he's about to do something to your boss. And, and so now you come, in to, you come in to see your boss that morning, you come in to see the priest, and you've been told by God how he's going to wipe out his family, wipe out his line, and, and judge him for what he has done and what his children have done. That's an awkward position to be in as the younger being, being told to go to the elder and tell him these things. And so uh, he fears to, to tell him the vision. Verse 16, then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, here am I. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me, of all that the things he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every wit, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Well, that's Eli speaking there in verse 18. It's amazing to me how in chapter 2, a man of God warns Eli of what's to come. And Eli does nothing about it. And then we see in chapter 3, he knows the message that's been given to Samuel is not good. Because in verse 17, he says, let the Lord do so unto thee and more so also. He says, whatever you say told you is going to happen to me, let it happen to you if you don't tell me about it. So he knows it's negative. He knows it's bad. In verse 18, when, when it's declared to him everything that has been said, Eli still, he does not repent, he does not ask forgiveness, he does not say, let me go talk to my sons and see what I can do. He says, what's the Lord? Let him do what he wants. Now, it's one thing to genuinely pray for the will of God. That's a good thing, but that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is a man who is unwilling to repent, a man who is apathetic towards his situation, a man who cares not for what has been told him, or a man who just doesn't see any hope or any future when, when so many times throughout history God has answered prayers of men that have been, been given judgments. You think of Hezekiah told to get his house in order because he would die and not live. And he turned his face to the wall and he wept and he prayed and, and God turned the prophet right back around before he ever left the man's house. And he said, you need to go tell him I heard his prayers and I'm going to add the years to his life. And so we see examples like that in scripture. We see Although God declared his judgment on King David, saying that the child he had had with Bathsheba would die, David still spent much time in fasting and praying over the situation. He knew what God had declared, and he prayed anyways, and he fasted anyways, and he sat in sackcloth and ashes anyways. When the Lord told Abraham he would destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, what did he do? He, he communicated with God, and he... he Essentially, he bartered with God, if there's, if there's 50 righteous, will you save the city? If there's 20 righteous, will you save the city? If there's 10 righteous, will you save the city? And, and he whittled God's number down. He whittled that standard down to just a few righteous in the city, and he would spare it. 
And of course, we know the rest of that story, but we know that God several times throughout history has been moved by prayer to change the direction of, the, of what's going on, what's happening. Eli has told his sons will die because of their iniquity and because he did not restrain them and he does not seem to care. He would have known of the times that God declared to Moses that he would wipe out the people of Israel and yet Moses prayed for them and God heard his prayer and God decided not to wipe them out. Eli would have known of Noah finding grace in the eyes of God when it repented God that he had ever made man, that there was only evil continually in the wickedness of men's hearts, and, and, but, then, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And Eli would have known of the intercessory prayer of Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he would have known all these things, and yet he does not attempt to turn God's heart by prayer, at least not that we see in the Bible. And so my question, the question that brings me that as a father I look at that and I say, why? Why would he not say, Lord, please spare my children? Lord, give me another chance. Lord, I'm sorry. Why would he not do that? I mean, we're not talking about just anybody here. We're talking about a priest of God. Why would he not pray and try to reach the Lord on behalf of his children, on behalf of himself, and, and correct the problem of what's going on in the sanctuary and what's going on in the temple? Um, this is my theory I believe Eli had no intention of repenting, and therefore he knew God would not be swayed by his prayers. God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you are not sorry for what you've done and you pray some little puny prayer that says, oh Lord, I'm so sorry, he's not going to be fooled by that. So Eli, I don't believe he had any intention of repenting. We don't see any intention of repenting here. And so knowing that, he would know that there's no point in praying if I'm not going to repent. What does the Bible say in James? What, what, what type of man's prayer is effectual in James? The fervent prayer of a, of a what man? Of a righteous man. You say, well, he's a, he was a priest of God. Yeah, but read again 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 29. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number, or I'm sorry, wrong, wrong reference. God, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29. God say, talk, speaking to, to him here through, to Eli here through the man of God, wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honor thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. To, to kick is to thrust out the foot or feet with violence, either in wantonness, resistance, anger, or contempt. It is to manifest opposition. So God, God declares that Eli was showing contempt and opposition to God's sacrifice by his behavior and by the behavior of his sons that he allowed to happen. And so he also says that Eli honors his sons above him. He says, Eli, you're honoring your sons above me. That's a problem. So we can look at this and say, well, is Eli a righteous man? No. No, not at this time. And you still, though, could Eli have repented? Yes, absolutely. Could he have repented? Could he have gotten right? Sure, he could have. But he didn't want to. He didn't want to. He had the ability to repent, but he did not have the desire to repent. As a result, when God pronounced judgment, Eli states, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. I almost think people use that as an excuse sometimes so they can just blame God for whatever happens. Well, it's just... God's going to do what he's going to do. I, I've heard people say, I, I know this is wrong according to the Bible, but I, I can't help it. I'm just going to do it, and God will just have to deal with me. <laughs> okay. It's not going to be God's fault. Whatever happens, it's going to be yours. Because you knew what the Word of God said, and you decided you weren't going to care what the Word of God said. You were going to continue on. Anybody ever heard this one? Well, that's just not my conviction. Hey, I understand that when it comes to things that are personal convictions. There are things that aren't spelled out clearly. Um, don't, don't misunderstand me. There are some things that, that to the, the, the degree to which they are to be taken and implied isn't real clear in the Bible. We have things, uh, things like modesty. We have 
modesty and modesty may mean one thing to you and one thing to another, you're going to answer to God for whatever you decide there. And there are some things in the Bible, or there's some things in our lives as Christians that God is going to convict you about, and, and you're going to have a personal conviction that it's near and dear to your heart that you make sure you do not do X, Y, or Z, or you make sure you do do this, that, and the other. You may be personally convicted to give 20% of your tithe. You may be personally convicted to give 20% to missions. That's a personal conviction. You can't put that on everybody else because God doesn't put that on everybody, but he might have laid it on your heart. And so there are personal convictions, but there are also, the word of God just clearly states some things are wrong. And to say, well, I'm not convicted about it is just to say, well, I just, I'm so seared. My conscience is so seared with a hot iron that I don't feel any shame in it. That's not a thing to use as an excuse to keep sinning. Just because you don't feel personally convicted about something that the Bible says is wrong, that just shows how far gone you are. You need to repent and get back to obeying the Bible. Now, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. What's the real problem here? I, I think I have a, a bead on what the problem here is here. You may disagree, that's fine, but, but I, I think you'll be able to learn something from this. I know I certainly did. Um, Colossians chapter 1. Eli honored his sons above God. The word honor is defined in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary as the esteem due or paid to worth, high estimation, or reverence. If you honor, esteem, or, or if, if your honor or esteem or even love could be separated into tears in your life, who biblically should have the top spot? This is going to be the easiest question of the day. Who should have the top spot in your life? All right, I heard Jesus, heard God. Congratulations, you're both right. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So we're talking about the Son here. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Verse number 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In all things he may have the preeminence. Jesus Christ is supposed to be preeminent in your life in all things. He comes before all things. He is prioritized above all things. There's about 20 sermons right there in that verse that we can't get to today. But can we honestly say that the Lord Jesus Christ, when you look back at our week, was prioritized above everything else in our life? Did we prioritize our time in prayer? Did we prioritize our time in the Word of God? Did we prioritize holy living according to the Scriptures? Did we prioritize church? Say, so, well, yes, except for this day. Yes, except for that day. Yes, but I had this going on. All right, well, then that's not a prioritizing. Prioritizing. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, we should be able to all agree on the first one pretty easily, I would hope. That God, Jesus Christ, ought to have the top spot when it comes to your honor, your respect, your admiration, your love. Should all be the top spot needs to be God. Needs to be the Lord. I hope we can all agree on that. All right. It's a quiet one today. I knew it would be. Ephesians chapter 5. It only gets worse from here. Don't worry. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. Who is the second spot? Well, if you're married, then the second spot is your spouse. Your spouse. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, we could look at a whole lot of verses about husbands and wives, but we, we, we ought to understand and know that be, beneath God, the top spot in our life for reverence, for love, for, for our charity, for our honor, is our spouse. That has to be true in your marriage. If that's not true in your marriage, then you don't have a good marriage. You may be making it work, but it's not what it could be. Biblically, you put your spouse above everybody else in your life, including yourself. The only person your spouse is not above in priority in your life is God himself. That's what makes for a good marriage. And that's an everyday decision. That's an every moment of everyday decision. That's not always an easy decision. But God gave you that spouse, 
and you ought to treat them the way the Bible says. Now, the third spot, that's where the children go. They do not share the second spot with your spouse. They do not share the first spot with God. And there's a reason for this. I think a lot of people would, you know, there's the saying, God, family, freedom, you know, faith, family, freedom, things like that. And I understand lumping the family all together, but biblically, your spouse is above your children in your priorities, in your love, in your honor, in your estimation. I'll tell you why. Your spouse is over your children in the Lord. Would you agree with me that the mother is over the children? She has authority over the children. Is that true? All right, all right, we're still good. Would you agree with me that the father has authority over the children? All right, a little weaker there, but we're all right. So what you do, if you, if you put your love for your children on equal footing with your love for your spouse, you have robbed your spouse of their authority. Because if I love my child just as much as I love my spouse, then, well, I just got to decide which one I'm going to go with. And an example of that would be, I, I've heard from some other pastors that I know, one in particular, he, he told me a story about a family who, um, well, they were coming to church, they were loving it, uh, dad was really thrilled to have a church that was preaching the Bible, everybody was enjoying it, and then the girl turned into a teenager, and everything goes downhill, I guess. <laughs> The teenage daughter decided she didn't like the church anymore. They're too strict. They're too Bible-centric. They're too this. They're too that. I don't like it. It's not nice. Whatever. And, and the dad, for a little while, nope, this is, this is where God wants us. This is where we need to be. And then, and then the, the daughter starts working on the mom. And the mom decides, oh, that, that preacher's a little judgmental. That Bible's a little hard. Let's, let's, maybe we should go find somewhere else, honey. Not because God told her, but because her teenage daughter told her. And then sure enough, a few months later, all of a sudden, the, the man is coming to the preacher and saying, well, God is leading me <laughs> to find somewhere else. Like, no, your teenage daughter is leading your wife who's leading you. That's a problem. When you put your children on equal footing with your spouse, you, you've got things out of order. Now, you ought to love your children. You ought to love your children dearly. But you have to love your spouse more. I know that's not popular. I didn't figure I'd get a whole lot of amens with that, but it's very counterculture. The culture is, oh, just make your child's life as happy as possible all the time. That's very damaging. That's not biblical. The, the, the culture is not the place to go for what is right and what is wrong when raising a family. If, if, you put, if a man makes his children equal with his wife, he has robbed her of her authority over them. If a woman loves her children more than her husband, she has robbed him of his authority over them. You see a child with no respect for their dad. You see a, you see a young boy with, that treats his mother like his maid. They learn that from somewhere, and they didn't always learn it from the kids at school. Sometimes they learned it from watching their parents interact with each other. They watch dad talk down to mom, they watch mom disrespect dad, and they learned, and, and mom and dad didn't talk that way to them. Every time they talk to the children, it's, oh, we love you so much, oh, you're so good at everything. Bunch of liars. <laughs> Not every kid is good at everything, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, nobody good would be good at anything. I know I'm not good at some things. I was told right before the service that there's no special today unless I want to do it. <laughs> You're welcome. I know what I'm not good at. <laughs> but if we're not honest in our raising of our children, if we're, if we're just all constant love, love you, you're so amazing, you're so wonderful to our children, and then eh, 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 to our spouse, no wonder our son's going to grow up to be terrible to women. No wonder our daughter is going to grow up to be a, a poor wife. Uh, we need to show them better. We need to show them better. And part of that comes from our relations with our spouse being the standard. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 10 tells us, Be kindly affection one toward, uh, to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. You've got God at the top spot. You've got your spouse on the second spot. You've got your children on the third spot. And then you've got the brethren. And, and then somewhere way down the line at the very bottom under your shoe, that's you. That's where, that's where you and I are when it comes to ourselves. We ought not esteem ourselves higher than we ought. We ought not think, think of ourselves higher than we ought. We ought to prefer others better than ourselves. We ought to love and reach the lost. We ought to do everything we can for them, uh, for anyone to be a Christian. But sometimes we get this backwards. We put ourselves above God. We put ourselves above our, above our spouse. 
Some people put themselves in front of their children, and that's very backwards. It's very wrong. So God told Eli, you have put your sons before me. And today, kids' activities are more important than 75% of church services. Say, so how'd you come up with that number? Well, Sunday school, too tired. Why are you too tired? Well, my, my kid was too tired. They were up playing video games last night too late, and they didn't want to get up. All right. Sunday a.m., well, we're going to go as long as there's nothing else happening. Sunday p.m., well, that's family time because we're so busy in our lives, we can't do family time any time other than during God's time. Midweek service, well, that's a school night and there's sports practice and there's this and there's that and the other. So pretty conservatively, I can confidently say most families in America place their children's activities, their children's uh, whatever you want to call it, hobbies, whatever, above 75% of church services. This is a real popular Sunday morning sermon, I can tell. This is going to be, whew, better make discs of this. People are going to want it. When you place the activities of the children above the activities of God, you have committed the same sin as Eli. You have put your children above your God. Say, well, it's just one service. You know, in Hebrews where it tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, does it it say one time a week? Uh Uh-oh. I'm only allowed to preach this on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights when, when that crowd's here. No, this is a crowd that needs it. The Bible says to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We, we'll easily say, oh, the Lord's got to be coming back soon. I see it's getting worse and worse. The Bible says that means we're supposed to be meeting together more and more and more. You want to go back to the, to the Word of God? You want to go back to the book of Acts? Well, how often do they meet? The Bible says multiple places they met daily. Oh, boy. (laughs) Like, don't go there, preacher. Don't worry, we're moving on. Isaiah chapter 3. In Isaiah chapter 3, you can turn with me to Proverbs chapter 13, but in Isaiah chapter 3, God speaks of a terrible time and a terrible state in Jerusalem. And in verses 4 and 5 and verse 12, we read, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. That's not a good place to be. In case you are wondering, that's all what's negative. Children ruling is negative. Children being oppressors is negative. And yet what do we see, not just in the grocery store out there in the lost world, but even in the church? Oh, honey, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? The kid's screaming, throwing a fit, and punching the wall, and punching mom, and punching dad, and going crazy. And it's just, what, what can we do for you? You're raising a monster. And I've been there. Believe me, we've got four kids, and they're all seven and under, and two of them are girls. Take that for whatever you think it means, but there have been times when we're just like, Lord, (laughs) what do we do? (laughs) I mean, we've got instruction in the Bible about how to handle this thing, but how many times in 10 seconds do we need to do that (laughs) to see a change? We get it. We understand. We're trying it's a process. Raising children is not easy, but it's a gift given to us by God. And if we start preferring them over God, then we're going to start looking to them and saying, do you feel like going to church today? How many of you, your, your dad asked you if you wanted to go to church? How many of you, you would have gotten in real big trouble if you said you didn't want to go to church? <laughs> yeah, yeah, belt clear and belt loops. <laughs> You're going to go to church and be glad the pew is padded. Were Eli to repent and try to restore proper worship in the temple, he would have to restrain his sons from all they were doing. I don't think he was willing to do that. We, we read about him talking to them. He gave them a talk. He didn't even go as far as a timeout. He just gave them a talk. And it didn't work, and he didn't do anything else. Even when it's declared that the children of Eli would be killed, There's no repentance, there's no correction, there's no conversation with the kids. It's just, well, let God do what he's going to do. I hope today that there's no Eli's in attendance, but it's likely that there are. Fathers or mothers who have allowed their children's happiness to be more important than God's pleasure. 
Fathers and mothers who allow their children to live in sin without restraint. Fathers and mothers who know that the path their children are on will lead to their hurt, but they will not rebuke them. And lest you think I'm just talking about people who have kids in junior church or in their lap or in the nursery, Eli's sons were adults in this passage. And the Bible, God says he made his, his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Present tense. He, God expected Eli to do something about his children's behavior as, as they were adult children. I used to tell the teenagers in youth group, I'd tell them, how long are you your father's child? You know, they, they start complaining about, you know, I'm, I'm a grown person. I'm a grown person. Yeah, you're a grown 15-year-old. All right. How long are you their child? Honor your father and mother. How long are they your father and mother? Till you're in the ground. That's how long. And so parents, you know, our children are going to have free will. They're going to do what they're going to do. I understand that. You can raise them in the nurture and of the Lord. You can bring them to church. You can pray with them. You can pray over them. You can do everything you can do. They still have a free will, and they may still go astray. And, 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 but, what, but Eli's fault is here is not that his kids went astray. It's that his kids went astray, and he didn't do anything about it. And so I'd encourage you, don't be the Eli in the story. Be the man who will say, child, I know that you're grown. I know that you're out of the home now, but you just need to be reminded that God says this and you're doing this and this is wrong and it's going to hurt you and it's going to hurt your future family. It's going to hurt your future bride or your children. You have got to get right with God. And if they say no and if they hang up the phone, at least you've done your part. At least you've tried. Don't ever give up on kids. Proverbs 13, 24 states, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Now, I'm sure you're probably not going to show up to your 30 or 40-year-old's house with a switch. That, that might not go over too well. But, but we see that we are, if we love our children, we will correct them. And I think we get it backwards so often when we think, well, because I love them, I can't say that to them because it might hurt their feelings or it might hurt them or, or it might hurt my relationship with them. And you're right, it could hurt their feelings and it could hurt them and it could hurt your relationship with them, but it's going to save their soul. It's going to help them to not ruin their life because you've corrected them because you love them. If we love them, if Eli truly loved his children, he would have stopped them. He would have done everything in his power to restrain them, as the Bible says, that he should have done. Lately, there's been a lot of um, outrage, and rightly so, over the push to allow children to determine their own gender. Um, it's insanity. It's, it's crazy. And there's churches going along with this, this nonsense. It's, it's ridiculous. So there's been a lot of outrage, right? They're, they're too young. They're not even fully developed. They, they don't understand what they're talking about. A little boy comes home and says, I'm a girl now. That's not okay. You, you, we understand that that's foolishness. You don't let a child change their, change their gender. You don't let a child go get gender-affirming care and take drugs and get chop, bits chopped off of them when they're a little kid or when they're a teenager because they don't know any better. They're too young to make decisions like that. And you say, yeah, that's right. I would hope you agree with that. I would hope you'd just be against child mutilation. I would hope you'd be against all that stuff because they're kids. They ought not be making decisions like that. They'll affect their whole life. And yet we turn to our kids and we say, do you want to go to church? And we let them control their spiritual life. We let them decide if they attend church, where they attend church, how often they attend church, whether they'll pray as a family, whether we'll do devotions as a family. And we'll look at the TV and we'll say, those crazy people that are letting kids making decision, make decisions that will hurt them for the rest of their life. And meanwhile, we do the same thing. Letting kids decide if they're going to read their Bible. Letting kids decide if they're going to pray with the family. Letting kids decide if they're going to be at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, youth group, whenever the church is open. We're hurting our kids. We're allowing our kids to hurt themselves. We cannot let the children run the home. Eli failed as a father because he refused to restrain his children. They ended up dead because of their sin. He did not restrain them. According to God's word, if we want what's best for our children, we'll show them that God's will is more important than, to us than their will is. But dad, I really want to do this. Okay, sorry, we got church. Sorry, we, we have to do this. I, I really want to buy that. I'm sorry, we're, we're giving this money to a missionary this month. You knew this. This is what we do as a family. I don't, sorry, you don't need new sneakers. 
If we truly love our kids, we will raise them, as Ephesians 6, 4 says, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what admonition means? It means to warn or notify of a fault. It means to counsel against wrong practices or to instruct. Nurture, we, we get that. That's the, that's the, you know, the nice, the coddling, the, the you know, the, that's what the ladies kind of do, right? It's nurturing. They're teaching them, but in a nice way. But the admonition part, that's where the restraint should be. We're, we're out of time. I, I know I'm pressing this hard this morning, and I know it's not really a Sunday morning sermon, but it's so important that Christians start raising our homes the way God intended. Because we see the attack on the home. We see, I was talking to my wife yesterday when we were driving. Uh, we had went to a wedding in Pittsburgh. We were driving home. And I was saying, it's amazing to me how often when you talk to somebody, um, for example, somebody, maybe their marriage is struggling, and you find out really quickly both of them had horrible examples in their parents of marriages. And so often you talk to people and it's, well, I didn't, my, my dad wasn't around. Well, that's a big problem. Or my, my mom was this, or my, my dad was that. That's a big problem. We, we, I, we've, no, we've met someone who, who their parents separated and lived in separate houses. They never got divorced. They never did any of that because they're Christians, but they didn't live in the same house as one another for 40 years. Can you imagine growing up like that? I mean, a lot of people do now. What's that going to breed? A godly, a godly home is a mother and a father who love one another and who work together to raise their children up, and there's no question who's in charge. When a child runs the home, how is it going to be when they have kids? When, when, a, when a son sees his father treat his mother like dirt, Lord help his future bride. And so we've seen a lot of this in our culture. We've seen the results of this in our culture. I just think we need to get back to the Bible and not prefer our children over our God, not prefer our children over our spouse, and start being parents like God wants us to be parents. And maybe, just maybe, we'll start seeing generational Christianity again. Maybe we'll start seeing children who respect authority again. Children who respect mom and dad and, and young men who will grow up to respect and, and cherish their wives and young ladies who will grow up to submit and, and reverence their husbands. It's such a rare thing today because the generation we have didn't see it in the generation prior. How do we stop it? Well, we get back to the book. We look at examples like Eli and we say, what a horrible father. I know that's harsh, but God says you did not restrain them. You let them make themselves vile, and because of that, I'm going to kill them. Your whole house is going to be wiped out, and he doesn't even pray for them. Doesn't repent. Nothing. Well, it's God. Let him do what he wants. If God were to just show up in a vision to you in a dream or whatever way you want to visualize this and tell you, I am going to kill your children. No context, no nothing, just I'm God, and I've decided I'm going to kill your children. You say, would he ever do that? Well, he just told Eli he's going to kill his children. He gave him reason why, but told him he's going to kill him. What would you do? I would hope that anybody here would say, please, God, no. Please, God, what can I do to change this? Please, God, what, what have I done to, to, to make this happen? I'll repent of it. I'll get it right. What can we do to avoid this? I would hope that that would be the response of, of anybody here and not just to be, well, you're God. You're in charge. It's one thing to submit to the authority of God. It's another thing to just not care what happens and then blame God later. Oh, God killed my kids. No. It's not the, not the thing to learn from this story. I, I'm done. We're going to wrap this up. I understand that. We'll, we'll have a short invitation in just a moment, but um, as they get ready for that, Eli and his sons, it's a sad read. There's really no way around it. I, I warned you, there's not a lot of joy in this story. It's disappointing, and it, sadly, it may hit very close to home for many. I know even some of you who your children are just away from God, and, and you, you wish they weren't. And, and I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm sure you pray for them daily, and I, I'm sure that you've talked to them, and I would just encourage you, don't quit. Don't give up. 
Keep admonishing them. Keep nurturing them in the Lord. Keep doing your best to make sure they understand and they know that they are wrong, but that you love them and God loves them, and if they'll just get right, they'll be welcomed right back. But don't enable sin. Don't be there to make sure that they can sin and do whatever they want with their lives and still be bailed out by mom and dad. That's not, that leads to destruction and it leads to death. But thank the Lord that in our studies so far, if this is your first, first sermon out of 1 Samuel with us, I feel bad for you, sorry. <laughs> but we got to see Hannah, who was the opposite of this. Hannah put God so high up, she said, Lord, as soon as he's born, he's yours. And she just gets to see him once a year, if that, when she goes up to the temple, because she has literally given her child to God. That's the, that's the standard we should shoot for, is God is so high and God is so holy and God has such a place of honor in my life that my child belongs to God, not just to me, but to God. Not to have the opposite of, my child is so high, my child is so important, my child is so loved by me that they are more important than God. I don't think many people here would just stand up and say, yeah, I put my kids above my God, but just think back to your actions, think back to what you've done, think back to the choices you've made. Are you guilty to some degree of that? Are we guilty of that? Simple yet convicting questions today. And she will begin playing the piano. You, the altar is always open for you to pray. But first question, do your children know that you love God more than anything else? Do your children know that? Do, your children, do you love your children enough to raise them the way God commands you to? Regardless of whether they cry, regardless of whether they think that you're mean, do you love your children enough to correct them, to admonish them, to nurture them in, in Christ? And children... Do you love and appreciate your parents for the correction they've given you? Or do you still give them attitude? Do you still think you know what's best? If your parents are bringing you to church, thank God for them. If your parents pray with you, thank God for that. If your parents see you in sin and restrain you, thank God for that. You'd much rather have correction from your parents that love you than from just a wicked life of sin and the, the, the sowing and the reaping that that brings. Many people have grown children today just like Eli's sons living in sinful rebellion against God's law. Maybe today you need to pray for a wayward child, perhaps for the courage to correct. Maybe you need to go to mom and dad and say, thank you for trying to keep me straight. As the piano begins to play, I, I, I would encourage you to just take some time and pray. Maybe it's your children you need to pray for. Maybe it's someone else's children. Maybe it's your relationship with your parents. Whatever it may be, I would encourage you to pray. And if that's not a need for you today, praise God. That's great. But I'm sure there's something you can pray for in this time. So we'll just, we'll let her play through. We'll take this time to just pray. And I would encourage you, there's a lot of people hurting right now. I'm sure there's a lot of people thinking of their grown children right now that they wish were here that they would give anything to see him back in church. Pray for him. Correct him in love. Don't give up. Thank you for this day and for the many blessings you've given us. Lord, help us.
Help us to see the importance of raising the next generation by the word of God. Lord, uh, I pray you please just comfort those who have children who are astray. Lord, give them opportunity to witness to them, speak to them. Lord, remind them to pray for them. Lord, help those of us who have children that we're, we're rearing right now. Lord, just help us to make sure that we seek your word and your will first. And Lord, help us to utilize those who have gone on before us and their wisdom. And Lord, I just pray you please strengthen the families in this church, strengthen the, the children and the parents. Lord, help us to be biblical, not just in our church, but in our homes. We'll thank you for it, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.